Good morning, everyone. I'm speaking today, initially, from 2 Kings, chapter 20, starting at verse 13. King Hezekiah received the messengers and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine oil, his armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say, and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came from Babylon. The prophet asked, And what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood that will be born to you, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? And we might think that attitude stinks. The sadness was that King Hezekiah was a good man and a good king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. For 29 years, between the ages of 25 and 54, God blessed his nation because of him. How grateful we are to have a righteous queen. We little realize the benefit to us as a nation. But Hezekiah, as it were, fell at the last hurdle. And here we see him smug, soaking in self-satisfaction, basking in the flattery of his visitors, boasting about his achievements, showing off all that he had acquired in the years as king, purring at their words of admiration. And his visitors were envoys from Babylon. For the word envoy, read the word spy. And we're told what God's reaction to this behavior was, and then we're told what Hezekiah's response was to God's reaction. In effect, he shrugged his shoulders and said, so be it, okay by me, that's fine. It'll be my kids, my grandkids, and their kids. They'll pick up the tabs. Yes, and some of his sons and grandsons and great-grandsons were likely to be hauled off to a foreign land and castrated and live the rest of their lives as slaves and die far from home. And then we notice our response to King Hezekiah's response. And perhaps we feel appalled or outraged. We think it's utterly selfish and we think it's utterly short-sighted. We're very quick to accuse, very quick to pick up the first stone, very quick to point the finger of blame. But we've been told in the past that when we point the finger of blame at somebody, there are three fingers pointing back at us. Let's hear what Jesus says about this. Now let's hear what Jesus commands about this. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that is in your own eye? When I judge somebody else, 
I set in motion a cycle, a wheel of inevitability that I not circuited in all likelihood the very thing or something similar as the person that it would be my criticism and condemnation of another person that brings that into my own life. I'll find that judgment is a boomerang. And I will receive as I have given, in full measure. People always seem to quote that verse in the realm of giving money. It's relevant in that verse. But it's spoken in the verse of judgment. As far as judging others are concerned, what I give will be what I get. Now this is a truth which is sobering and perhaps even scary. I'll give you a trivial example. A friend of mine in the days when it was possible to lock one's car key in one's car did, did just that. And his wife went ballistic. She tore strips off him. She called him every name under the sun, which meant the same as fool. And within a week, or was it 10 days, she'd done the same thing herself. Do you say that's coincidence, or do you say that's cause and effect? How many teenagers are bitterly critical of their parents and then later in life end up just like their own mother and father, and sometimes worse? Now, God convicted me on my response to Hezekiah's response in the story that we have read. The background is this. We're living in a world that is running out of resources. Now we understand that the mandate to the human race is to look after this world, to cherish the earth, to care for it, to cultivate it, to steward it on behalf of God. That's the job we've been given to do. God's gifts, in a way, are sometimes better seen as loans. We don't own our children, they're on loan to us, and the invitation is to care for them and nurture them on God's behalf. Now, we're living in a world where the population is ever-growing. And mankind, yes, through greed, selfishness, short-sightedness, has been over-exploiting the earth, over-exploiting the ocean. Mankind has been forcing some creatures into extinction and upsetting the balance of nature. And a day of reckoning is approaching. It's a scientific fact. Now, we all like the blessing song. We listen to it, we sing along to it, we make it our prayer. And may the favor of God be on a thousand generations, on our families and our children and their children and their children after that. But the danger is, particularly for people of my generation, is that we can take comfort from the fact that we know that the full harvest of the climate change catastrophe which is awaiting us is going to happen when we're far gone. We won't be here to see it. And we're just adopting the very same attitude of King Hezekiah. We might find that historians, when they look back on 2021, recognize that the most far-fetched and far-reaching thing which happened was not even the survival and overcoming of the pandemic. It might well be the outcome of the United Nations Global Climate Warming Conference scheduled in Glasgow the first 11 days of November. Thankfully, the Americans will be represented. It will be under the presidency of the United Kingdom. And I believe that Christians across the globe should be praying for that conference. Why? Because hard decisions need to be made and hard changes are going to have to follow. And every change will cut across somebody's vested interest and be contested. And perhaps God is asking us individually to make some changes maybe in our lifetime. Now we understand, don't we, that God gives us all things richly to enjoy, and we enjoy God's gifts without feeling guilty. But responsibility always follows privilege, and God is asking us always to be grateful and to be generous in the measure of his goodness. 
Now, how is God challenging us as individuals? I know some people who are changing their lifetime who have done their lifestyle, and they have done, and I respect them greatly. In June in 2015, Julia and myself were in the capital of Iceland, and we went to visit the cathedral there. It has steps rather like Westminster Abbey, and in the time it took us to climb those 15 or 20 steps, we were approached, accosted by two different young ladies. They both wanted the same thing. They showed us a postcard, let us read the contents, and ask us if we would sign a declaration to say while in Iceland we would not eat whale meat. It was on the menu of quite a lot of the restaurants. There was an embargo against whale hunting through much of the world, but at that stage it hadn't reached the shores of Iceland. I signed those two declarations quite happily, but my memory is of how much I respected those two young ladies, one from Sweden, one from Spain, early 20s, maybe on summer vacation. They would have had to find or raise their fare to Iceland, no budget airlines run to that country, the money for their food and their accommodation. They were standing hour after hour, talking to strangers in a second language or a third language, trying to persuade them of their cause, no doubt being rebuffed by a number of them. And I remember thinking, these young people, what matters to them matters enough to motivate them. They're not paying lip service to the cause. They care enough to pay a cost. And I did think, well, they'd make fine disciples of the Lord Jesus. I believe Christian people need to be informed on this environmental issue and need to have a voice. And there is one thing that every single one of us can do. We can declare and wage war on waste. Waste is abhorrent to God when we waste his goodness to us. If we read the story of the feeding of the 5,000, I think there are probably four miracles that happened that day. The two you'll think are small, but miraculous to me anyway. The first is, that that lad, it was almost evening, had not even touched his picnic. He must have been mesmerized by the teaching of Jesus. Take a party of children from a school on a day outing, and usually within 10 miles of the school gates, their picnic lunch has gone. The second miracle is that boy was willing to give up his lunch. He must have thought how hungry he was just when food was mentioned. But he gave it up seemingly to no purpose. And I think he deserves to have his name put down in scripture because of it. The third thing is, and we don't notice it very often, 5,000 men, look at the average congregation, probably more women than men and kids. It could have been 10 or 15,000 people there. And the word tells us, only in the one gospel, that Jesus healed all who needed healing. They didn't have to ask for it. The word came forth. Now, it was, of course, miraculous. He had no amplification, but such was the anointing on his voice that it carried across that high hillside. We find the same when Wesley and Whitfield preached in the Out of Doors later on in church history. And without being brought to the front, how well, many of those great crowd went back and had a story to tell for the rest of their lives. God had healed them through the words of Jesus, his son. And then the fourth miracle the one we focus on, every single one of that crowd had enough to eat and to spare. They ate till they were satisfied. And then Jesus spoke four words, and God would speak the same today. Let nothing be wasted. And the disciples went and collected all the leftovers. They had 12 baskets of leftovers, one for each of them if they wanted it, and they wouldn't have thrown away the rest. God doesn't want us to waste. There are many things we can waste, and maybe we do. We can waste gifts and talents, leaving them lying dormant, creative talents, and nothing comes of them, and we lose out, and many other people will lose out also. We can waste opportunities. Opportunities are gifts. We can either accept them or refuse them. That's our choice. Some of us in life are grateful that we took opportunities in the past, 
Maybe there was a risk factor. By the grace of God, we took them. Our lives would have been so different and so much poorer if we hadn't. The world tells us that opportunity seldom knocks twice, and there's a truth in it. Then, after opportunities, we can waste time. And probably we all do. If I invited somebody to come into my house as a guest and I found that they were pilfering from me, I would show them the door. And yet we can bring things, people, sorry, we can bring things into our house and they don't take money or goods, possessions, which are replaceable. They steal from us, potentially, oceans of our time. We think we've got plenty of time, but we don't know how much we've got left in the bank balance of time, and there's no statement available to tell us. You know the things I'm thinking about. There's nothing wrong with any of them. But never has a generation had so much opportunity to waste their time with things like their television and their computer and their PlayStation and their smartphone and their tablet, all the other devices, perhaps, which enable us to engage in social media. And we are in the generation where perhaps it's never been easier. We have more leisure and more ability just to waste time on what is endless and sometimes profitless entertainment. 168 hours in the week, and we have the same, all of us. Perhaps it would be good to analyze our use of them one week. And remember, nothing wrong with rec recreation and relaxation. That's necessary but it shouldn't consume large portions of the day. Then we can waste food. If we've lived in what we call, God doesn't, the third world, we won't like seeing food thrown away. We can overfill our fridge, we can overfill our plates. There's a mountain of food waste in this country alone every day. And it's almost criminal when we realize so many people, children too, go to bed hungry. I'm glad to say they're going to change the wording on many packets, not all of them. Instead of saying used by a certain date, to say best before a certain date. We can waste water too. That's a precious commodity. It's going to be ever more precious. Maybe wars will be fought over water. And we have pure water out of our taps. We can drink it. That's not true for many countries. But the point is, if we're not having a water meter, we can just pour it away as if it didn't matter. But water is valuable. We can waste food, we can waste water, we can waste electricity and gas and oil and fuel. And worst of all, of course, by running our own lives and not letting Jesus be king, we can waste our lives. Waste to God is abhorrent. I believe we need to be allowing the peace of God to umpire in our hearts. What do I mean by that? If we're being wasteful, we'll find that our peace is disturbed and we feel a sort of uncomfortable restlessness and that's God speaking to us. I want to end with this. There are many characteristics we like to see in the lives of God's children. I'll mention four. We like God's children to be those who seek the praise, the applause, the approval of God, not the admiration of men. Secondly, are people who look beyond their own interests, who look for the interests of other people, sometimes put those interests before our own. Strangers, yes. People who will follow in our footsteps. And that means putting the interests of the planet before our own. God wants us to be people like that, not self-preoccupied to the extent, as long as I have peace and security in my lifetime, so what? And then thirdly, I believe God's people, it would be desirable if they enjoy children. Watch children. Children in our own family, our own church, our own neighborhood, our own society. Children on a television screen, babies, toddlers, preschool, primary school, secondary school. Look at them, delight in them, and ask ourselves this question. What kind of world do I want that child to inherit? when I'm gone. And then fourthly, let's be a people who live in the light of what God reveals to us and the words he speaks to us. Let's live in the light. 
Maybe let's live in the light of what God is seeking to show us today and say to us today. Now we'll have a moment of pause. Let's be first responders to God's word. A moment of pause. I'm going to pray a dangerous prayer. And if we like, we can say amen to it. Father, whatever you ask us to do, if you show us clearly, if you give us the help, if there are any changes you want us to make in our lives, we declare today that we will do it. Amen. And may God bless you all. Thank you.